up, middle schoolers? How are we doing tonight? Good. Okay. Really good on this side of the room. Not so strong over here. Okay. Yeah, we're having a good day. All right. Hey, I, I'm really excited about tonight's message um, because tonight we are going to get to talk about... You ready? Ready for it? We're going to get to talk tonight about what is possible if you would surrender your life to Jesus. And I know we talk a lot about that, but I think that what we are going to talk about tonight, and when I say what is possible uh, in, in our world, in our families, um, I believe every single one of us wants it. I believe every single one of us needs it and desires it. And so my hope is tonight that you would lock in for just 15 minutes. And as we talk about the character of God, as we talk about his triune nature and all of the things that come with that, you would be challenged to say, yes, I want to be a part of that and I want to experience the blessing that comes from that, middle schoolers. If you have a sheet of paper in front of you, tonight uh, I'm going to ask you to hold on to that. I know sometimes we leave them in here, just hold on to those sheets of paper. Uh, And if you're taking notes on a, a notebook or in your phone, whatever, just hold on to what you write down tonight because what we are going to do is when you go to small group afterwards, there's going to be some things that I'm going to ask you to share with your small group tonight. But some things that I'm going to challenge you in. But before we get into all of what we're going to get to tonight, I want us to recap the last two weeks that we have been in this triune series. And here's how we're going to do that. The first week is we're just going to talk about what we learn, and that's who we worship. And we worship a triune God who is one. We talked about how there is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all equal in their nature. They are all God, but they are different and distinct persons within the Trinity. So a triune God who is one, that is who we worship. And then last week, Tucker did an awesome job talking about why we worship. And it is the fact that God has made us one with him. He talked about how the Holy Spirit is active, how the Son is active, how the Father is active in our salvation process, how the Father adopts us, how the Son redeems us through his blood, and how the Holy Spirit seals us and keeps us, and how the, how the one God that we worship is all active in that salvation process. But like I said, tonight we're going to talk about how it is. So we've talked about the who we worship, the why we worship, and now we're going to talk about the how. How do we walk out of this place? How do we live as believers, as followers of Jesus properly? How do we live in a way that worships this triune God? And so what we're going to do is the same thing that we did the first week, right? There's a lot of outside opinion, a lot of things that we can maybe think up. If I said, hey, how do you worship? There's a lot of things that maybe you're coming up with a list in your head. Maybe it's, well, I worship by knowing a lot of Bible verses, right? Or I worship by setting apart a time. And, or, or maybe I worship by going to church. And here's the thing. While those are good things, and I'm not going to tell you not to do those things, I want us to do the same thing that we did in week one. And that's see what does God have to say for himself, Not what do our thoughts come up with or what does the outside world say? Hey, these are the ways to be a a Christian. These are the ways to, to walk. But what does God himself say about how we ought to be living as Christians? And so what I want us to do is as we go to the Bible tonight, I want us to look at a prayer that Jesus himself actually prays for us. A prayer that Jesus himself prays and what he asks God the Father to do in our lives and what he wants to see take place. And in John chapter 17, we're going to read just a little bit of that chapter tonight. We're going to read about three or four verses, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to actually go back and read it in context. Go back and tonight, maybe before you go to bed, put your phone up 10 minutes before you normally would and just read the whole chapter and see the things around it. But tonight I want us to zero in and just focus on a couple of verses. And as we do, we're going to see that there is one thing above all that Jesus asked God the Father to do and see in our lives. And this is it. Jesus wants to see unity. Jesus wants to see us as a people, as followers of Jesus, be unified together. To be brought together as one people with one mind intent on one purpose. And so as we go to this tonight, I want us to first look at two things that unity requires. And the first is that unity requires a knowledge of God. Unity requires a knowledge of God. Let's read that passage that I was talking about in John chapter 17. Again, this is a part of a longer prayer that Jesus prays. He says, may they, or all the followers of me, all Christians, all believers who are true and genuine, 
may they all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. We're going to come back to that part later. I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one. And this is so important. As we, or as the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one. That the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And so we see that in this prayer, that Jesus' desire for unity, this desire for oneness in the hearts and minds of believers comes directly from his knowledge of the unity and the community that exists between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see, because nobody knows more about God than God himself, and we talked about it week one, how Jesus is God. And so what Jesus knows about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is that with those three persons in one God, there exists a perfect community. You see, we have a hard time grasping what a perfect community, what perfect oneness and unity look like. But Jesus himself, when he prays this, he knows that between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is perfect love and submission and honor and glory between them. And so it makes sense that Jesus' desire, his prayer for his people who are made in the image of God to reflect that perfect community of God. And so Jesus prays this and he knows about the community of God. And so we have to, if we are going to see unity take place in our church, in our small group, in our families, we have to know who God is. We have to know that he exists in unity with himself. You see, if we're going to live that out, we have to know that. But you see, knowing God and knowing about God is only one half of the equation. You see, because the other thing that unity requires is a knowledge of ourself. Unity requires a knowledge of ourself. You see, the Bible has a lot to say about the person of God, but the Bible also has a lot to say about us and our sinful flesh and our desires. There's two passages I want to draw our attention to tonight. One is in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, for the flesh, which all of us have this sinful flesh, for the flesh that all of us have desires what is against the spirit. And we talked about it week one, how the spirit, the son, and the father all have the same desires. And so if our flesh is against the spirit, we can make the, the assumption and the conclusion that our flesh is also against the son's desires and the father's desires. You see, the spirit desires what is against the flesh, and these are opposed to each other. You see, sometimes we think, and I hear this all the time, right? I grew up a Christian. I've always been right with God. You see, no, no, no. Every single one of us starts, and if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, right now, your flesh is against the spirit. You stand against, and the Bible actually calls you an enemy of God. And so we have to know this about ourselves. And there's another passage that dives a little deeper into this in Romans chapter 8. It says, for those who live according to the flesh, which is everyone who hasn't surrendered their life to Jesus, have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death. You see, what we desire, and I think this word death means a whole lot more than we just are, are walking away from God. You see, our flesh, our minds, our desires are actually the complete opposite of the spirits, of the sons, of the fathers. Keeps going, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. Again, enemies, because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. And then listen to this. Those who are in the flesh, those who are outside of God, who have not been brought in by the blood of Jesus, cannot please God. You see, I think there's a lot of you in here, middle schoolers, who are working and trying so hard to please God. You think that if you get the grades, you know the Bible verses, you come to church, you please your parents, you have all of your life put together. You're trying so hard to please God. But what the Bible is so clear about is that in and of yourself, middle schooler, that is impossible. It's impossible for you to work and earn and please God of yourself. And so this is why it takes a knowledge of God and a knowledge of self. Because when we think, okay, here's what I know about God, that he is holy, that he is perfect, that he exists in community that is perfect, Father, Son, Holy Spirit set apart. We know that about God and we know this about ourselves, that we are sinful, we desire death, we desire pride, we desire destruction and disruption. When we recognize those two things as true, 
And maybe you've never taken the time to understand who it is that we are worshiping, who it is that we are singing to, and you've never taken the time to self-examine, wait, I am in my sin and I am separated from this God. See, we have to know both of these things because if there is any hope, middle schooler, if we want to have unity with others, we must first have unity with God if we intend to have unity with others. And here is what I want to spend just a few minutes on because this is paramount. This is so important. This is the most important thing you will ever hear in your entire life. The number one thing that you need in this world is not a relationship. It's not a friend group. It's not a grade. It's not a status. It's not an achievement or a position. It's not anything. It's not the approval by your parents or your small group leaders or us even as a staff. The thing that you need most in this life, middle schoolers, is to be brought and unified and made one with the God of the universe who loves you so much. You see, because again, all of us in this space at one point or another, whether right now you have not surrendered your life to Jesus and you are outside of God, or you have surrendered your life to Jesus and at one point you were outside of God, we all need to be brought in. You see, we all need to be brought in. And I want to go back to what Tucker talked about last week in the fact that Jesus sent by God died the death that every single one of us in here deserved. Everything, every single one of us in here deserved death, but he has died for us. And the Holy Spirit, if you surrender, believe, and commit to following him, the rest of Romans chapter eight, I don't have it in here. But again, I would just encourage you, go and read the rest of Romans eight. Because what that verse that we stopped on says, it, it, you cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It continues on and it says, but those who have been brought to life by the spirit can And so we need to be brought to believe in Jesus and to be brought into God by the Spirit's power. See, we have to know this triune God and his character. We have to know ourselves and our sinful nature, and we have to be made right with God by believing in Jesus and committing to follow him. And then if you do that, and this is what I was talking about at the beginning of the night, if you are to do that, And if that's something that you're like, I think I want to do that. I'm I'm questioning it. I don't really know. Here's what I would challenge you with middle schoolers to bring that up in small group or to call a leader off to the side and just tell them that. Because if you are to do that, then unity is possible. And I don't have to go on and on for a long time. It doesn't take much to see that we live in a world that is so disunified, that is so broken and so messed up. But you see, Jesus, when he prays this, he asked that believers would be unified. And so if that is going to take place, we are made right with God first, and then unity with others is possible. And now I want to kind of switch gears. And I want to talk to the believers in the room, the ones who have said, yes, I have committed my life to following Jesus. I am saying yes to this. I loved reading, Tucker and I loved reading those intake forms that you filled out. And I saw a lot of you said, yes, I am committed to following Jesus. And if that is the case, then unity is the call and challenge for you. Jesus prays that in John chapter 17, that if you are a follower of Jesus, that unity would take place. And if it does, I want us to look, as we close out tonight, at two things that will result if we are unified and if we love and live in a community of unity as believers. Two things that will result from that. Number one, unity will result in proving our discipleship. Again, we talked about this earlier. There's a lot of different ways that we can say, okay, here's how I can prove to the world. Here's how I can prove to people that I'm a disciple of Jesus. And whatever list you come up with, Jesus narrows it down to just one simple thing. He says, the world will know that you are my disciples if, and he says this in John chapter 13, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, by loving one another, by living in unity, everyone will know that you are my disciples. See, I've talked to way too many people. I know people who are are my age who came to this youth group and didn't experience unity. And, And they were gossiped about, they gossiped about people, and they didn't experience the love and unity that we are called to. And the world sees that. And the world says, I don't think that that's what a follower of Jesus is supposed to look like. And they're drawn away from it. They don't want anything to do with it. And so as much as you can try to prove, and these are people who had it all put together on the outside, but there was so much disunity within that there was no proving your disciple. And so if you want to say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. If you checked yes on that box a couple of weeks ago, then you have to if you are going to prove to the world and to people that you are a follower of Jesus, you have to live in unity with one another. And then the last thing is that unity results 
in the world believing in Jesus. The worst thing that you can do if you're going to go out and try and share the gospel like all of you who say you're a believer should is to live in a way that is disunified with other believers. Because what the world is going to do is they're going to hear the message that you have to say, hey, follow Jesus. And then they're going to see how you interact with other people who follow Jesus. And they're either going to say, yes, I'm all about it, or I don't want anything to do with that. And so I would just challenge you to think for a second, as people look at your life and they see how you interact with your small group, what you do with what's shared in your small group, does that make people want to follow Jesus or does it make, him, make them want to have nothing to do with him? And I think for a lot of you, I, I really want to challenge you to think about that in your small groups. Am I treating other people in a way that makes the gospel and makes being a Christian attractive to the world around me? As we close out tonight. As we close out tonight, I want to give you guys an opportunity to just reflect, to just think for a second. See, on your paper, there's some reflection questions, and in just a moment, we're going to read those privately, and I'm going to ask that every single person in this room answer those questions. But before you do, if you're taking notes, I just want you to look at the screen for just a second, because there's a verse that that came up in a conversation this week uh, with a, a friend And in this verse in Psalm 139 says this, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. And so before you answer those questions, I just want you to take 10, 15, 30 seconds and pray this verse before you answer those questions. And just say, God, would you search me? Would you know me? And would you show me if there is anything in me that is not of unity. So read this, pray it, and then those questions are going to be on the screen in just a second. They're on your sheets of paper. And I want you to hold on to those papers. And small group leaders, if you have a chance in your groups later on tonight, I want you to just ask the answers to those questions. And I want you guys to be bold to share those things with your group. So in just a minute, I'll pray, but take a second, read this, pray it, and then answer those questions, and then we'll close out our time together. pray together. God, we come to you just in awe of who you are. Father, I have been so challenged over these last couple of weeks as we've taken just a a moment to look at you, to see how you are working. Father, to see your nature as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how you have been working. Father, to bring students, to bring people to know you, not as a far off God, but as a father. Father, I pray for these middle schoolers tonight as they head to small group. Father, would they be bold to to admit 
if they don't understand what it means to be unified with you? Father, would they be bold to admit where their flesh and their sin has fallen short and has caused them to not be of unity in their communities? And Father, would you now, in every single person's mind, would you place one name at least uh, of a person that they need to go and be made right with, a person they need to go and either forgive or ask for forgiveness to bring about unity? And Father, we ask that you would search us and know us. And if there is any way in us that is not leading us to the way everlasting, would you remove it? And would you place your spirit within us and lead us in your way in every area of our life? Would we bring you glory, would we bring you honor, and would we walk in unity that the world may know the love that you have for it? We pray all of this to the Father, by the Son's power, the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.